I advised him to send for his immediate superior, and for a doctor, also to allow nothing to be removed, and as few fresh footmarks as possible to be made, until they came. In the meantime, I searched the dead man's pockets. There were his handkerchief, a large knife, and a small folding card case. From this projected a slip of paper, which I unfolded and handed to the constable. There was written on it in a scrawling, feminine hand, I will be there. You may be sure, Maudie. It read like a love affair, an assignation, though when and where were blank. The constable replaced it in the card case and returned it with the other things to the pockets of the Burberry. Then, as nothing more suggested itself, I walked back to my house for breakfast, having first arranged that the base of the cliff should be thoroughly searched. Stackhurst was round in an hour or two to tell me that the body had been removed to the gables, where the inquest would be held. He brought with him some serious and definite news. As I expected, nothing had been found in the small caves below the cliff, but he had examined the papers in Macpherson's desk, and there were several which showed an intimate correspondence with a certain Miss Maud Bellamy of Fulworth. We had then established the identity of the writer of the note. The police have the letters, he explained. I could not bring them, but there is no doubt that it was a serious love affair. I see no reason, however, to connect it with that horrible happening, save, indeed, that the lady had made an appointment with him. But hardly at a bathing pool, which all you were in the habit of using, I remarked. It is a mere chance, said he, that several of the students were not with Macpherson. Was it mere chance? Stackhurst knit his brow and thought. Ian Murdoch held them back, said he. He would insist upon some algebraic demonstration before breakfast. Poor chap, he is dreadfully cut up about it all. And yet I gather that they were not friends. At one time they were not, but for a year or more Murdoch has been as near to Macpherson as he ever could be to anyone. He is not of a very sympathetic disposition by nature. So I understand. I seem to remember your telling me once about a quarrel over the ill usage of a dog. That blew over all right, but left some vindictive feelings, perhaps. No, no, I'm sure they were real friends. Well then, we must explore the matter of the girl. Do you know her? Everybody knows her. She is the beauty of the neighbourhood, a real beauty, Holmes, who would draw attention everywhere. I knew that Macpherson was attracted by her, but I had no notion that it had gone so far as these letters would seem to indicate. But who is she? She is the daughter of old Tom Bellamy who owns all the boats and bathing coats at Fulworth. He was a fisherman to start with, but is now a man of some substance. He and his son William have run the business. Shall we walk into Fulworth and see them? On what pretext? Oh, we can easily find a pretext. After all, this poor man did not ill-use himself in this outrageous way. Some human hand was on the handle of that scourge, if indeed it was a scourge which inflicted the injuries. His circle of acquaintances in this lonely place was surely limited. Let us follow it up in every direction, and we can hardly fail to come upon the motive, which in turn should lead us to the criminal. It would have been a pleasant walk across the time-centred downs had our minds not been poisoned by the tragedy we had witnessed. The village of Fulworth lies in a hollow, curving in a semicircle round the bay. Behind the old-fashioned hamlet, several modern houses have been built upon the rising ground. It was to one of these that Stackhurst guided me. That's the haven, as Bellamy called it, the one with the corner tower and slate roof. Not bad for a man who started with nothing but, by Jove, look at that. The garden gate of the haven had opened, and a man had emerged. There was no mistaking that tall, angular, straggling figure. It was Ian Murdoch, the mathematician. A moment later we confronted him upon the road. Hello, said Stackhurst. The man nodded, gave us a sideways glance from his curious dark eyes, and would have passed us but his principal pulled him up. What were you doing here? What were you doing there? he asked. Murdoch's face flushed with anger. I am your subordinate, sir, under your roof. I am not aware that I owe you any account of my private actions. Stackhurst's nerves were near the surface after all he had endured. Otherwise, perhaps, he would have waited. Now he lost his temper completely. In the circumstances, your answer is pure impertinence, Mr. Murdoch. Your own question might perhaps come under the same heading. This is not the first time that I have had to overlook your insubordinate ways. It will certainly be the last. You will kindly make fresh arrangements for your future as speedily as you can. I had intended to do so. 
I have lost today the only person who made the gables habitable. He strode off upon his way, while Stackhurst, with angry eyes, stood glaring at him. Is he not an impossible, intolerable man? he said. The one thing that impressed itself forcibly upon my mind was that Mr. Ian Murdoch was taking the first chance to open a path of escape from the scene of the crime. Suspicion, vague and nebulous, was now beginning to take outline in my mind. Perhaps the visit to the Bellamy's might throw some further light upon the matter. Stackhurst pulled himself together and we went forward to the house. Mr. Bellamy proved to be a middle-aged man with a flaming red beard. He seemed to be in a very angry mood, and his face was soon as florid as his hair. No, sir, I do not desire any particulars. My son here, indicating a powerful young man, with a heavy, sullen face in the corner of the sitting room, is of one mind with me that Mr. McPherson's attentions to Maud were insulting. Yes, sir, the word marriage was never mentioned, and yet there were letters and meetings, and a great deal more of which neither of us could approve. She has no mother and we are her only guardians, we are determined. But the words were taken from his mouth by the appearance of the lady herself. There was no gainsaying that she would have graced any assembly in the world. Who could have imagined that so rare a flower would grow from such a rut and in such an atmosphere? Women have seldom been an attraction to me, for my brain has always governed my heart. But I could not look upon her perfect clear-cut face, with all the soft freshness of the downlands in her delicate colouring, without realising that no young man would cross her path unscathed. Such was the girl who had pushed open the door and stood now, wide-eyed and intense, in front of Harold Stackhurst. I know already that Fitzroy is dead, she said. Do not be afraid to tell me the particulars. This other gentleman of yours let us know the news, explained the father. There is no reason why my sister should be brought into the matter, growled the younger man. The sister turned a sharp, fierce look at him. This is my business, William. Kindly leave me to manage it in my own way. By all accounts, there has been a crime committed. If I can help to show who did it, it is the least I can do for him who is gone. She listened to a short account from my companion, with a composed concentration which showed me that she possessed strong character as well as great beauty. Maud Bellamy will always remain in my memory as a most complete and remarkable woman. It seems that she already knew me by sight, for she turned to me at the end. Bring them to justice, Mr. Holmes. You have my sympathy and my help, whoever they may be. It seemed to me that she glanced defiantly at her father and brother as she spoke. Thank you, said I. I value a woman's instinct in such matters. You use the word they. You think that more than one person was concerned? I knew Mr. McPherson well enough to be aware that he was a brave and strong man. No single person could ever have inflicted such an outrage upon him. Might I have one word with you alone? I tell you, Maud, not to mix yourself up in the matter, cried her father angrily. She looked at me helplessly. What can I do? The whole world will know the facts presently, so there can be no harm if I discuss them here, said I. I should have preferred privacy, but if your father will not allow it, he must share the deliberations. Then I spoke of the note which had been found in the dead man's pocket. It is sure to be produced at the inquest. May I ask you to throw any light upon it that you can? I see no reason for mystery, she answered. We were engaged to be married, and we only kept it secret because Fitzroy's uncle, who was very old and said to be dying, might have disinherited him if he had married against his wish. There was no other reason. You could have told us, growled Bellamy. So I would, father, if you had ever shown sympathy. I object to my girl picking up men outside her own station. It was your prejudice against him which prevented us from telling you. As to this appointment, she fumbled in her dress and produced a crumpled note. It was in answer to this. Dearest, ran the message, the old place on the beach just after sunset on Tuesday. It is the only time I can get away.